going to follow up on everything we've done so far in circadian rhythms and uh, getting your body detoxed and whatnot. This kind of ties in nicely with today's topic, which is uh, sleep cycles, sleep cycles, sleep patterns, what it actually is, stages of sleep, and so on and so forth, because uh, there are noticeable differences between genders, so so to see, uh, so it seems, because uh, it seems like men might get away with it, uh, sleeping a bit less than women. And there is also a difference between REM sleep and uh, deep sleep and how it affects our body, uh, as there are also a lot of tracking tools that sometimes I feel are misused. So for me personally, I don't like tracking sleep as per se. I like checking if I am getting fitter and stronger, which I can use different tools apart from sleep cycle tracking devices. So what's out there? Let's let's look into stages of sleep to begin with. Uh, maybe just over kind of overview of why sleep is important. Why the hell do we actually sleep? You know, can't we just go hours and hours and hours without it? Maybe days. Uh, there have been some experiments on that as well. I forgot the ones that they did where people literally were chewing their hands off and whatnot. <laughs> I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of crazy. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of crazy sleep deprivation experiments. Yeah, so out there, that's for sure. Let me break us down. Why sleep is important. What's happening in a sleep and... Is it similar to the way we approach training and nutrition? Hey, there needs to be some kind of sequence for it to be actually effective for our body. What is happening? Under, un, let's put it this way, under natural circumstances, really not much to think about other than you go to sleep. The problem is we don't live in those circumstances, right, in the modern world, which is probably going to be a little bit more of what we talk about today. Um, but in in essence, what what is sleep? Sleep is the how would I call it, the default stage of cells. So in other words, when you sleep, that is the primordial setting for all cells, right? Is uh, this, this concept of consciousness and being awake, that's an evolutionarily new thing, right? Think of it this way, like people don't necessarily argue that plants are not necessarily living or not. The problem is, they probably don't have consciousness, right? They can't move about, they can't have their own thoughts, but it's they're, they're alive, right? They're, their cells are moving, they're creating energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this thing called consciousness is the act of migrating from a plant organism, a multicellular plant organism to a, a eukaryote or, organism that can move about in, in some way, shape or form. So consciousness is an evolutionary trait the problem is consciousness causes damage. So in other words, every day, even if you didn't do anything, even if you didn't do anything, but you woke up, you are going to create some level of reactive oxygen species. Why? Because you're breathing oxygen. It's really that simple, right? Ox oxidation, right? When we talk about getting fit, we're talking about fatty acid oxidation, right? That's the act of burning body fat. So you are causing some level of stress just by being alive. That stress has to be compensated for when you go to sleep. The more stress, and, and the other thing is specifically about stress is that it all goes into one bucket, right? So any stress, mental stress, physical stress, stress you can't see, stress you can't feel, will affect you in the almost the same manner at the cellular level. So it all gets handled by sleep. So that means that any stress that you experience during the day can be undone during sleep under normal circumstances. We'll get later into what that means. Uh, and you kind of highlighted in previous videos as well as that it's important to have stress or you can't get any better. Correct. Right. Right. So, so one, uh, so one of the key points, you know, focusing on sleep specifically, one of the key points that dictates how you go through your sleep cycles is actually this reactive oxygen species and the amount of melatonin that needed to be secreted during the day, right? Because uh, this is another thing people don't understand very well about melatonin. Melatonin is made in your mitochondria during the day, during the day. Okay. It is made by your mitochondria during the day because melatonin's primary function is an antioxidant function, which means it is 
the more reactive oxygen species that your mitochondria make or nitrogen react uh, reactive nitrogen species that your mitochondria make the more melatonin it's going to secrete to combat that oxidation that's why it's going to secrete an antioxidant called melatonin that is the base level antioxidant at the mitochondrial level the more and more melatonin that gets secreted uh, and, the, and the other fascinating thing about melatonin is melatonin actually is water soluble and fat soluble it's one of the few that is both water and fat soluble so what does that mean it means it can penetrate anywhere that's what it means so when your mitochondria are making it uh it can easily throughout the day disperse to the rest of the body and then in the evening when light goes away melatonin goes up to the brain and puts you to sleep why is that it's a really handy way for evolution to go hey there was this much damage done during the day and we had to make this much melatonin so we'll use melatonin to tell us how much damage we need to repair in the at night when we sleep right it's very very simple to understand when you kind of link it that way the amount that you sleep is directly linked to the amount of melatonin you release and the melatonin that you release should be linked directly to the amount of stress that you've experienced through the day right um and and that means cellular stress physical stress mental stress because any stress dictates that work needs to be done for example if you're emotionally stressed then your body is going to catabolize some melanin or some uh adrenaline uh into dopamine or vice versa it's going to catabolize dopamine into melanin or dopamine into noradrenaline uh, or or even further back than that it might even catabolize dopamine or adrenaline into your thyroid and metabolism hormones right depending if somebody scared you for example right um so <clears throat> all of those uh I think is very uh, I, I think uh, very popular from uh, what I see in blood work a lot that uh, thyroid gets skewed up massively especially now when winter comes yep and and it's more pronounced in females right it's more pronounced in females especially their t3 value it's usually taint um so that brings us to the next step right uh, of as far as talking about sleep right and you can quickly start to see you know just from what i just mentioned about like catabolism of dopamine melanin noradrenaline into thyroid hormones or vice versa um and how the the little habits that we try to get the people to do especially in the summertime build melanin so that you have it in reserve to do more work in the winter so that you don't run out of reserves to create your thyroid system right but most people don't get to the point where they get a nice really aggressive tan for four or five months so they don't really have very many reserves so come winter time things get this uh skewed and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, and it all starts with sleep actually okay so now that we kind of established that link between melatonin stress during the day and how that amount of melatonin correlates to how much and how deep you're going to go through your sleep cycles okay so really high amounts of melatonin are going to de uh, dictate a deeper sleep cycles so that might be more deep sleep or it might be more REM sleep depending on whether you need to restore more brain function or whether you need to restore more physical function right like uh you know you've been training really hard for for several weeks uh so you need to restore more physical function you're going to the the deep sleep versus the REM sleep will be skewed one way or the other if it's more mental and central nervous system related it'll be more skewed towards REM sleep but we don't really have control about that uh in terms of hey I, tonight I'm trying to gonna try to get more REM sleep that's not really a thing that you can control uh versus deep sleep that is dictated by this internal mechanism that I just talked about it's the damage that your cells are registering uh that gets released into the form of melatonin and other substrates um but the main one's going to be melatonin when it comes to restoring your brain okay now having said that um things you can do right so well let's back up just a little bit I mentioned the de delineation of some sleep will restore your brain and other sleep will restore restore uh physical damage more easily right and there have been several studies done on this and they've come to find out fairly consistently that sleep gets 
pushed one way or another between mental restoration and physical restoration, uh, depending on the day or the, the time of night. So in other words, early in your sleep, so before midnight, tends to restore brain function more. So you could be somebody that's like, hey, I just got to do a lot of mental stuff, right? You would be way better off going to bed at like 9 p.m. and waking up at 1 a.m. You would just that, wake up at 9 a.m. Sounds like a natural selection of why all these business coaches talk about like get up early and get to bed early. So they might yeah, have- Yeah, they, 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 that's probably an adaption. That they that they, feels that more clear in their mind. Not that mm -hmm. it does anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and so that's what, you know, depending on what you're wanting, can you skew making sure that you're restoring the thing you want? Yeah, absolutely. If you got a lot of mental work to do and you're a really busy person and, you know, you need 18 hours a day of being awake. Well, then in that case, I would skew, hey, try to get to bed as early as possible, like 9 p.m. and wake up as early as you can stand, right? Like 1 a.m. would be like the cutoff. So from 9 to 1, that's uh, what is that? Uh, five hours. Um, so five, no, four hours. That's yeah, four hours. Um, so that's four hours. That's not a lot of sleep. But I guarantee you, you wake up at 1 a.m. and brain function will probably still be pretty much intact. Um, you know, stretch that out for another hour and wake up at 2 a.m. That's still a long ass day, right? Waking up at 2 a.m. and not going to bed until nine. That's a long day. You can get a lot of stuff done, especially if your brain is functioning correctly. Now, on the flip side, right? If you're training really hard and that sort of stuff, uh, they have found that sleep into the morning. So in other words, the second half of sleep tends to recover physical stress slightly better. So if you are somebody who's been training really hard and and you know going through a fat loss phase or a building phase and you're just your body's a little bit beat up, a little bit extra sleep in the morning will do you better. So I, I'm not saying go to sleep late because that's still going to not repair your brain function. But if you can spend an extra hour asleep during the morning time period, uh, then you will get a little bit more extra recovery, right? But maybe maybe your job involves not doing anything other than your job, right? Maybe you're a, literally a bodybuilder, right? So in that case, hey, going to sleep at midnight and waking up at 9 a.m. probably isn't really a bad idea considering you don't really have- Yates has mentioned that he used to sleep 10 hours uh, between 10 and 8 every day. Mm -hmm. Then he would always sleep two hours after training. So 12 hours of sleeping every day. Yeah. And this is also why I always keep a uh, kind of- highlighting to people who go oh i'm gonna train like mike menzer and dorian yates and this and that i'm like dude can you afford to sleep half a day you probably can't so you can't train like that you just can't right right or at least you won't make progress anyway because the sleeping part is what makes the progress right like we all kind of know that if you don't sleep you're not going to make progress you're not going to make progress in fat loss you're not going to make progress in muscle building so if you can't afford to sleep you can forget about that level of training Right. It's very simple. Just just like I explained or at the very beginning. Hey, sleep is linked to the amount of stress that you induce. If you induce more stress, you need better sleep. Better sleep doesn't necessarily mean longer sleep, but it can sometimes, especially in the physical sense. But in the mental sense, you you're, you can you can get away with quite a bit if you know how to structure your sleep correctly for mental capabilities like i mentioned earlier right like if you're a ceo of some kind um or something like that getting up early is to your benefit going to sleep as early as possible is to your benefit it, it extends the amount of work you can do for the day and it doesn't compromise mental capabilities nearly as much as trying to cut your sleep short at the front end. So in other words, getting a lot of work done at night and then trying to go to bed at midnight and then waking up at like 6 a.m. That's a recipe for poor mental function. You're going to you're going to drag. You're going to really drag. You're going to basically be living off of caffeine at that point because the, the one of the main things that gets uh, taken care of is adenosine. So adenosine, we all kind of understand as, you know, coffee tends to block adenosine, the, the receptor for adenosine. That's what feels like you're more awake. Um, that has that, that adenosine level accumulates throughout the day, because that's also one of these other factors that's accumulating during stress, during being awake. Um, and the more it accumulates, the more it allows for brain restoration 
in the first half of the of the of the sleep cycle. So that first half of the sleep cycle is mainly taking care of adenosine buildup in here. That's why you can get away with, hey, I'm just going to sleep the first half of the night, wake up really early, and your brain feels pretty fresh because you got rid of the most adenosine at the beginning stages. And if you skip that stage, you don't get rid of nearly as much adenosine. So you wake up the next morning and you still need caffeine to feel remotely okay because you haven't gotten rid of enough adenosine to lift brain fog and those types of things. This brings me to question about sleeping disorders. So when people wake up in the middle of the night and then they can't fall asleep or they struggle to fall asleep to begin with or they wake up groggy. So is there anything that you can kind of suggest to... Like, I don't wake yeah. up. I'll just sleep through, but I sleep only five hours. So I kind of can't afford to wake up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, is there anything that causes it? Uh, yeah. Apart from the most obvious, picking up your goddamn phone when you go into toilet in the middle of the night is not a smart idea. Is there anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, number one, uh, light hygiene. Uh, well, let's let's back up a little bit and define some of these terms, right? So, the part about like falling asleep, like you lay in bed, but it takes you thirty minutes to fall asleep. That's very poor sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency has to do with how long are you in bed before you're passed out, before you're asleep? The shorter that time frame is, the better your sleep efficiency. That's governed by the initial stimulation of melatonin raising. So the thing that controls that is light hygiene. So if you're trying to get to bed at nine, my suggestion for everyone that wants to do that is at a minimum, have some blue light blocking glasses so that you can put them on so that you can stop blue light entering the eye so that you can start e even at a minor level, even if you have all your lights on with some blue light blocking glasses at a minor level, melatonin will start to raise. And you would want to do that about 90 minutes to two hours before the planned time to go to sleep. Now, if you wanted to take that a, a step further, you, you turn off overhead lighting and turn on lamps. So lower lighting. The reason for that is because the receptors in the eye that are linked to blue light are at the bottom of the eye. So if the light is coming from above, it, you're going to get more dominant stimulation and suppress more melatonin. When you lower the light to below eye level, now the light is mainly hitting the top of the eye and the top of the eye doesn't have nearly as many receptors for blue light. So it also changes the mood. You want to take that a step further, change the lights to, to red lights, just red light bulbs, right? And that will that will eliminate any blue light and melatonin will be released semi normally. Um, and then the final, you know, and most obvious step is not having fake light uh, at all, just candle light, fire light uh, that will not interfere with melatonin. I think it's only like a point one percent that it will interfere with melatonin release. So all of those things increase sleep efficiency. Okay, So that's the falling asleep part. Now, the staying asleep part, that actually has to do with earlier parts of the day. The, the staying asleep part has to do with something called vasopressin. Um, it's also known as antidiuretic hormone. And uh, that actually has to do with the accumulation of solar energy during the day or cold energy. So just being out and about outside, right? And that's not possible for everybody. But I don't mean you need to be physically working outside. I just need actual stimulation of the external environment. That helps bring down vasopressin, right? So during the day, if you think about it, antidiuretic hormone, vasopressin, we'll just call we'll just call it antidiuretic hormone for now so that people clearly understand what it's doing. So antidiuretic hormone goes down during the day and the more daylight and the more cold you experience the further down it goes which means you're going to urinate a lot okay you're going to urinate during the day okay and that changes the density in your csf and your in your cerebral spinal fluid during the night the further down the antidiuretic hormone went the higher up it's going to go if you've suppressed it correctly so in other words, if you've gotten outside and suppressed it correctly, there's going to be the takeaway of the action that suppressed it. And when that goes, antidiuretic hormone goes nice and high. That also paired with melatonin 
keeps you asleep because the antidiuretic hormone is there to relax everything and keep your bowels from wanting to go. Most people are going to wake up because of almost like, a, even if they don't go to the bathroom, almost like an urge to go to the bathroom. And that's because antidiuretic hormone is coming down or never got very high to begin with, right? So that is what actually is the most helpful for keeping you asleep. Um, again, it doesn't mean that you necessarily get up and go to the bathroom. It's because you're waking up because there is not enough antidiuretic hormone to keep the density of your, your uh, cerebral spinal fluid um, in correct balance for nighttime, for, for just being immobilized. Um, that's actually what it's mainly responsible for. Like most people call it just antidiuretic hormone, but the, the, the real name for it is vasopressin because it's, uh, doing something with the vascular nature of your brain. So your kidneys release it into your CSF, right? So it has a direct connection to the brain to change vasculature and function at the brain which isn't surprising because that's what's supposed to happen at night. You're supposed to pass out. You're supposed to be immobilized and your brain is now taking care of a lot of things and taking care of itself as well. So those are the main things that will uh, help with sleep. So sleep actually starts with daylight exposure in the morning, the correct day, daylight exposure of morning time and evening time set the switches for your body understanding when to release things or how much of them to release and then the absence of light triggers the whole system the absence of light think of it like the 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 trigger on a gun you're you're pulling that trigger when there's no light present and then that lets off all the events um now those are all under normal pseudo normal modern living conditions right now, are there things that can still interfere, especially with the staying asleep part, uh, and 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 to some extent even even the the falling asleep part, even if you're doing really good with light hygiene, right? Even if you're using some blue light blocking glasses or red light in general at night, you're probably going to find that you fall asleep fairly good, or fairly easy. But there might be circumstances, especially in the modern world, where you just don't get restful sleep. That ties back to what's going on in the actual sleep cycle, right? So what I mean by that is this. You're supposed to have light sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, go through all of those. The length of time of each of those will vary depending on what your body sensed as far as the amount of stress you accumulated. And then it's supposed to repeat four times that night, right? So you're supposed to go through those cycles four times. The bottom site, the bottom part of the cycle is REM sleep. REM sleep is dictated by alpha waves, okay? Alpha waves in the brain are what should be happening or are that, that I mean, so like if you had a whoop or an aura ring or something, something that measures, you know, deep sleep uh, and REM sleep and light sleep and stuff like that, that's what it's measuring. It's measuring the frequencies of the nervous system, right? Now, what's unique about REM sleep is that it's alpha waves. Um, not a lot of people know this, but that's also the same frequency of the earth. The earth has a frequency at 7.83 hertz. That frequency is called the Schumann resonance, okay? What does that tell you about sleep? It tells you that every night your brain syncs up with the frequency of the planet. That's what tells it to drop down to that uh, 7.8 hertz REM sleep, right? But what happens if you are you know, sleeping with your cell phone next to your head or sleeping with the Wi-Fi router on in your bedroom, or you have, uh, you know, you live next to a airport, you know, and they have radar going everywhere. Your, your brain is going to have a really hard time distinguishing which frequency it needs to sync up with. See, because you got to understand if you didn't have any of those interfering things, when the sun goes away, the electromagnetic field of external sources from the planet goes away. The only electromagnetic field left is the electromagnetic field from the planet, right? And so your brain over evolutionary timeframes has picked up that and goes, oh, I just, to, to be completely relaxed and get the most restorative function, I just need to relax and get back in frequency with that baseline frequency of 7.8 Hertz, which is the earth. The problem is under modern living conditions, you can end up in a way where your body just doesn't understand what that frequency is, 
right? It, it, it can't find it in all the noise. So you get very poor REM sleep. And that is something that you'll notice. So if, if somebody's doing all these things, right? Um, you know, good, good light hygiene, uh, getting outside, that sort of stuff, but they're still suffering from, from poor sleep, then that's where something like an aura ring or a whoop band will come useful because the first thing you're going to see is their REM sleep is shit. It's like 20 minutes for the whole night, right? So if you start seeing that, that tells me immediately, oh, there's a problem here that's external to this person because REM sleep is the detection of the Schumann resonance. And you're only getting 20 minutes of that. That tells me that your brain is having a, a, a problem understanding how to find that frequency or, or how to tune into it, right? And so that's where you get into electromagnetic field testing, uh, little experiments like, you know, you, instead of going through and getting all the equipment and hiring somebody, you can literally, you know, do the experiment yourself by just going somewhere for a week, right? Go somewhere that's slightly more remote, slightly out of the way you know so that you aren't next to a cell phone tower aren't next to a you know airport or things of that nature like do your you gotta you gotta shop around you gotta do your due diligence for the right place but it's easy enough as just airbnb you know in a cabin somewhere uh slightly remote uh, go there for a week if your REM sleep improves dramatically now you know hey it's an electromagnetic field issue and then you can go back and start troubleshooting your right your your place um but that is the telltale sign of too much electromagnetic field interference and how that's correlated to your poor sleep or inability to sleep well yeah and we see it a lot when you go somewhere in a remote place and you come back and you're like oh i had the best sleep ever even if you go on a seaside you know when you don't have mm -hmm. one that's next to the city you'll feel massive difference. So all that broken down, uh, let's dig into supplements because everyone will think about, hey, what can I take before sleep? You know, melatonin and GABA and whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you name it. So uh, is there anything that people can take to improve their different sleep cycle at all? Or is there anything that people should definitely not take to not disrupt their natural sleep cycle and instead focus on their habits yeah so as, right off the bat things people should not take as far as supplements goes the number one is melatonin now a lot of people are going to be like well i do that all the time and it's you know you can get it for pennies without a prescription why you know i'm like well the, it, it goes back to what i stated at the very beginning melatonin is tied to the cell cycle right? The amount of stress that your cell experiences releases melatonin if you uh, are tuned correctly. And that taking it externally means that you're doing some things that are not necessarily bad, but over time can lead to some eye problems specifically, right? So melatonin is an antioxidant, right? And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the studies on vitamin C and high dose vitamin C and how they can prevent a muscle hypertrophy and all of those types of things. Well, that's because it's an antioxidant and it is lowering stress. The problem is this, most people that are going to take melatonin, they're not going to have good high uh, light hygiene. So the, the specific problem with melatonin is this, if you take it and you leave all your lights on at night over time, your retina will thin and you'll get myopathy. The reason for that is because blue light into the eye is a stress response. We highlighted this in our um, video about uh, DHA and how it's important for the eye and, and, the, and how it gets recycled through the liver and stuff like that. Blue light induces a stress on the eye. When you take melatonin externally, uh, that actually starts to downregulate the response the stress response that your eye has. So your eye doesn't repair nearly as good when you have melatonin and lots of bright light over time done regularly will cause more and more blurry vision and more and more eyesight problems. That's really the big detriment, especially for kids because they're still developing and mothers are giving their kids a lot of melatonin because they don't realize this link between, hey, TV lighting, tablet lighting, phone lighting, plus the lighting in your house, uh, especially in the winter time, that's five hours of blue light stimulation and you're suppressing melatonin. And then you give them melatonin with all this light environment, it will thin their retinas and, and 
they become myopic, um, more glasses, and eventually can run into macular degeneration. Now, um, if you are traveling and things of that nature, melatonin can be helpful now that you know better, right? You're going to be like, okay, I'm going to dim down the lights. I'm not going to have any blue light entering in my eye. You take a little melatonin to set yourself up for the new time zone that you're in. That can be helpful, but it's very rare that you want to do it regularly. It's not a thing you want to do. If you find yourself that, hey, melatonin is the only thing that puts me to sleep regularly, the first thing you need to do is start looking at, hey, how much time am I spending outside and how how much light am I getting during the day and, and stuff like that. Um, so right off the bat, that is one thing that you don't want to take. Now, things that can help that do not have the same risk that can be taken fairly regularly, uh, especially in the winter time. I find that these are more helpful because, you know, it, it gets dark at 5 p.m. Or, or sooner for some people. So it's like nobody's going to go to sleep at 5 p.m., right? Nobody's going to go to sleep at 7 p.m. So you got at least two or three hours of fake light that you're going to turn on in the winter time. So is the kind of flip the switch more immediately. So, hey, at 7 p.m., I start dimming my light so I can get ready for bed at like nine or something like that uh, is GABA. So I like to have people, if they if they live somewhere and they struggle with falling asleep, and stuff, is GABA with their last meal. So most people will eat dinner around 6 or 7 p.m. They take some GABA with that. And then a couple hours later, they're relaxed enough. But I also, you know, have them be mindful about their light. So as the evening progresses, after they've taken their GABA, they start dimming down their lights. Immediately, melatonin starts to be re released with the, the relaxation of the GABA, makes them less anxious and allows them to fall asleep very well. Another thing that's kind of off brand that, uh, you know, because GABA, you could, you could give it to children. It's not like that there isn't any studies that it's good or bad, but Benadryl, which is an antihistamine that's given to children very regularly. And it does cause some grogginess in, in most people, not everybody. But if you are one of the lucky few that you can take a little Benadryl and it makes you groggy, that's a much more useful thing than the melatonin because you can take that fairly regularly. I mean, it's kind of designed that way for, for allergies. Um, and it does make you groggy. It makes you pretty sleepy. And it has a benefit. It actually starts to mess with your circadian rhythm a little bit. It, for, for people that respond positively to it, hungry that is a crucial thing to understand when you are getting good proper sleep you're getting good proper sleep you you normally should wake up fairly well rested fairly awake without any coffee right the coffee is more of a choice than a need at that point and the other thing that most people will start to experience is they're hungry they're hungry within the first hour of waking up that's a key sign that your circadian rhythm is actually functioning very well you wake up about seven to eight hours after falling asleep. You wake up without much, much grogginess. And within that hour, you feel hungry and you've eaten some food. Benadryl tends to set up the circadian rhythm exactly for that. You're going to wake up about six, seven hours later, and you're going to be kind of hungry. And and you have to uh, actually fulfill that, right? You, you, you eat some food because there are three things four things, depending on how detailed you want to get, that dictate and set up the circadian start-stop switches. One of them is obviously daylight. The other one is cold. And the third one is food intake, right? So if you're somebody who likes to fast every morning, you set yourself up for potential disturbance of your circadian rhythm because you're not giving it the first input of the day, which is food at the beginning part of the day. I'd rather have Talk people about fast. Previous videos and that might be the contributor why you feel that you are getting really great results at the beginning, and later on those results either stop or actually make you worse than when you started your fasting. Yeah, you know that's not something yeah. you're practicing over and over and over again, and uh, if not done correctly, it can actually mess you up. Correct. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's. And answers the question about the supplements. There, there's very few. Let's put it this way. There's lots of sleeping pills that's been shown over and over again that you don't want to take those. They actually don't let you sleep. You don't go through your sleep cycles very well. That's a that's anesthesia, basically, right? That's not the same thing. That let's yeah, let's make that clear too. <laughs> sleep medications don't actually help you sleep. They immobilize you like an anesthetic does but your brain waves don't change. So that's a huge problem. You don't, that's that's another one on that don't take list if you can avoid it, right? Like, um, 
I'd rather I'd rather you become a, a slight insomniac and take some adapanil during stay awake and we figure out a way to fix the sleep thing on its own than take sleep medications. That's a that's a big recipe for not a lot of good things. <laughs> yeah, I think you covered most of pretty much any questions that could be. So sleep cycles, how they how they happen, how you can fix them basically starting with your day, make sure that it it all comes to just daily habits you know we have such a stressful lives now and stress means by just being bombarded with probably social media and environment like such you seem like you need to be somewhere all the time so you are trying to run 24 7 and then by the time you get back home you feel like you're overwhelmed you're not done enough and then you try to do some more stuff and you end up scrolling on social media just to get distracted and get some dopamine and sooner or later all is going to fall apart and you'll just be relying on drugs to keep you awake drugs to keep you asleep yeah, yeah. and living properly because there is yeah. nothing better than feeling healthy and vital and yeah. that can only happen if you actually give your body time to recover repair itself and functions the way it's supposed to be done you know instead of yeah. just stimulants and something that makes you numb so if there is anything you think there is to add to, to this uh, at all or uh, you think next next time we're probably going to move into deeper about radio frequencies and everything that can interfere not only with sleep cycle itself but humans ability to get stronger get fitter recover faster i think that would be good yeah to yeah yeah, we, we can definitely de delve deeper into that electromagnetic field thing. Today, we touched specifically on a couple of the nuances of how it can affect your sleep, but we'll 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 do a video specifically on the cell, specifically on metabolism and what it's actually doing, right? What is actually being messed up, right? So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, David, for your time, and I'll see you next video. Awesome.